All right, let's get this coffin open. Everyone loves Dracula. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who doesn't love a good vampire story? Exactly. But here's the thing. Yeah. The book, the original Dracula, it's a little different than what we usually see in movies. That's true. So this deep dive, it's for anyone who's ever watched a vampire flick and thought, wait a minute, did they even read the book? Oh, I know those people. We're going deep into Dracula adaptations, comparing eight films to the source material. Yeah. Bram Stoker's novel. Should be interesting. It's trickier than you'd think to adapt Dracula. You think so? Why is that? Well, for starters, the book's structure is really unique. It's told through diaries, letters, all these different voices. Right, right. It's not a straightforward narrative. Exactly. And then there's Dracula himself. He's this elusive figure. You rarely see him, but you always feel his presence. That's hard to translate to film. Yeah, that makes sense. But filmmakers have certainly tried. And tonight, we're ranking eight of those attempts, not by how good they are, but by how faithful they are to Stoker's vision. It's a fascinating way to look at these films because some of the most beloved adaptations took the most liberties. The scandal. Right. Speaking of liberties, let's start with a silent film masterpiece that actually got its creators in trouble. <laughs> Nosferatu from 1922. Oh, Nosferatu. It's a perfect example of it's complicated. How so? Well, it's a visually stunning film, no doubt. But they basically ripped off Stoker's story without permission. Bram Stoker's widow actually sued them for copyright infringement. Seriously? Oh, yeah. They changed all the names, slapped some creepy makeup on the actors. That's not Dracula. That's Count Orlock. Exactly. But, and here's the interesting part. Even though they played fast and loose with the details, Nosferatu nails the mood of the novel. Okay, I see what you mean. They use stark shadows, distorted sets, these really eerie expressionist visuals. It's true. It's a very unsettling film. Right. And it creates that same sense of unease, of creeping dread, that Stoker so carefully crafted in his writing. So, points for spooky vibes, even if they borrowed a little too heavily. Okay, I've got to ask, what about everyone's favorite Texan vampire hunter, Quincy Morris? Does he ever get his due on screen? Poor Quincy. He's often sidelined in adaptations. Oh, really? Why is that? Well, it highlights the challenge of adapting a book to film. You have to make choices. Right. And Quincy, he's so tied to the specific mechanics of the novel's plot that he often ends up on the cutting room floor, which is a shame because he's a great character. Totally. Okay, next up we have a real head scratcher for you. Apparently, a ton of Dracula films make Lucy Westenrell look exactly like Dracula's dead wife. Oh, yeah. Which is not in the book at all. Nope. Have you noticed this trend? It's funny how that crept in, right? It's mm -hmm. not Stoker, that's for sure, but I think it speaks to a larger fascination with these tragic vampire love stories. Right. The idea of Dracula eternally searching for his lost soulmate. It's a good hook. Right. It's a trope that's wormed its way into the genres. Okay, I get it. <laughs> Adds a layer of romantic longing, even if it's a little creepy. Hmm. And speaking of romantic longing, can we talk about Frank Langella? Oh, yeah. Dracula, 1979. That was the movie that made vampires, well, sexy. You're right. That film was a turning point. Suddenly, Dracula wasn't just a monster. He was a heartthrob. Right. It's interesting how those perceptions change, right? It really is. I think it reflects how our culture views sexuality and desire. Those things evolve over time, and how we portray vampires reflects that. Fascinating. And those collars were all the rage, too. But let's be real. When it comes to iconic Draculas, it's a showdown. Bill Lugosi versus Christopher Lee. Oh, two titans of horror. Two very different approaches to the character, too. Right. Lugosi, he defined Dracula for generations. That voice, that presence, it's iconic. But then you have Lee, who brought a certain ferocity, a physicality to the role. The first time I saw Christopher Lee as Dracula, I was hooked. He's mesmerizing. There's this intensity, this ruthlessness that really set him apart. And yet, neater adaptation is perfectly faithful to the book. Right. It just goes to show that sometimes a really powerful performance can outweigh some creative liberties. True. Speaking of creative liberties, what about Coppola? Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yes, from 1992. Oh, visually stunning film. Absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, Coppola, he takes some serious detours from the source material. Detours. He took the scenic route, reincarnation, love across time. It's a lot. He really put his own unique stamp on the story. So, out of all the films we're looking at, which one actually takes home the most faithful adaptation award? This might surprise you, but it's a 1977 BBC production. Really? It's not one you hear about often. A deep cut? Exactly. Tell me more. Well, it didn't have a massive budget, no big name stars, 
but it followed Stoker's plot incredibly closely. Like scene for scene. Almost. It makes you wonder if sometimes those smaller productions, they feel freer to just focus on the story. Interesting. Less is more. Right. This BBC version, it might not be as visually lavish as some of the others, but it's meticulous in how it follows Stoker's plot points. It's a fascinating watch if you want to see the book brought to life on screen as faithfully as possible. So we've talked about one big thing that often changes in these adaptations. Yeah. Dracula's powers. Oh, absolutely. The book gives him a whole bag of tricks. Hypnosis, superhuman strength. He can even crawl down walls like a spider. Right. He's not just your average vampire. So how do filmmakers even begin to handle that? It's a lot. It really depends on the adaptation. Some go all out. Special effects and all. Oh, yeah. Transforming into bats, wolves, mist, you name it. Others keep it more subtle. How so? They might rely more on practical effects, shadowy cinematography, just suggesting his powers rather than showing everything outright. Because some things are scarier when you don't see them directly, right? Exactly. It's all about what translates well visually, what's better left to the imagination. Sometimes a less is more approach is far more effective in building suspense. For sure. And let's not forget about the castle. Of course. You can't have a self-respecting vampire movie without a creepy castle, right? It's practically a character in itself. Right. And again, the way filmmakers depict it varies. So, what are we talking about here? Some films go for that grand, gothic architecture. You know, towering spires, crumbling stone, cobwebs everywhere. Classic. Others embrace a more dilapidated, decaying look, almost like the castle itself is dying. Ooh, spooky. Right. And just like with Dracula himself, I think the design of the castle often reflects the overall tone. Are we talking seductive beauty or pure, unadulterated horror? It's like the castle becomes a reflection of Dracula's character. Exactly. So in your expert opinion, what actually makes for a truly memorable Dracula adaptation? Faithful to the book or not? Ooh, that's a tough one. Right. I think it comes down to a few key ingredients. First, you need a captivating Dracula. Of course. He's the star of the show. Right. He needs to be charismatic, menacing, and just a little bit seductive. Even if he's not the romantic hero in every version, there's got to be that something about him. The je ne sais quoi. Exactly. Then you need a strong supporting cast. Van Helsing is almost as crucial as Dracula. Oh, for sure. That battle of wits is essential. Absolutely. And we can't forget about the victims. Right. Their fear, their transformation, it adds to the emotional stakes of the story. The best adaptations make you care about those characters. Yeah. Even if you know what's coming. Right. And finally, I think atmosphere is everything. The music, the lighting, the pacing. It all needs to work together to create that sense of creeping dread that makes Dracula so effective. You've got me wanting to rewatch all of these movies. That's the beauty of it, right? It's not about crowning one adaptation as the best or the most faithful. It's about appreciating how filmmakers have brought this iconic story to life. And maybe sparking some fun debates along the way. Speaking of debates, I've got one for you. Do you think a Dracula adaptation can ever truly capture the magic of reading Stoker's novel for the first time? Hmm. Good question. That's the ultimate question, right? It really is. Can a movie ever really capture that feeling you get when you read a book for the first time? When you're picturing everything in your head. Exactly. Yeah, it's like comparing, I don't know, apples and blood oranges. I like that. Both delicious but in totally different ways. Right. But here's what I find so interesting about Dracula. No matter how many times he's adapted, there's always this element of mystery, this this unknown. Right, there's always more to uncover. You can never quite pin him down. Exactly. That's why he's, I don't know, he's such a powerful figure in horror because well, he represents our deepest fears, mm-hmm. our fascinations with, with those things that go bump in the night. He's the ultimate outsider. And yet we keep coming back for more. We do. We can't resist him. So, okay, we've talked about some of the things that change in these adaptations, but what about that 1970-77 BBC version you mentioned? Oh, yeah. The one that supposedly got it right. This adaptation, it's fascinating. It's kind of a hidden gem. Really? Didn't have a massive budget, didn't have big-name stars, but it followed Stoker's plot incredibly closely. Wow. So how close are we talking? I mean, almost scene for scene in some places. Wow. So it's like, if you want to see the book on screen... That's the one to watch. It really is. I mean, it's a great example of how faithfulness isn't always about lavish sets or crazy special effects. Right. Sometimes it's just about capturing the essence of the story, respecting the source material. I love that.
Yeah. It's a good reminder that there are those hidden gems out there for those who really want to find them. Speaking of different kinds of fans, we haven't really talked about Dracula's brides. Oh, the brides. They're such an iconic part of the story, but they always seem to take on these, well, these different roles depending on the adaptation. Oh, absolutely. They're fascinating figures, aren't they? They are. In the novel, they're definitely alluring, but they're very much secondary to Dracula himself. Right. But then you get to these films, and they take on this much more prominent role, almost like extensions of Dracula's power, his influence. And they're not afraid to use it. Yeah. And their parents is too. I mean, sometimes they're seductive and glamorous, and other times, well, they're just straight up monstrous. It's true. It's another example of how filmmakers have really interpreted and then reinterpreted these characters over the years, reflecting changing attitudes. I mean, attitudes towards beauty, towards female sexuality, towards evil itself. It makes you think about how these films are like these time capsules. Absolutely. Reflecting the anxieties, the fascinations of the era they were made in. Right. And with a story as timeless as Dracula, those reflections, they can be pretty insightful. So, okay, before we wrap up here, I've got to ask. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Dracula adaptation? Ooh. Or a favorite Dracula performance? You're asking me to pick a favorite child. I know, it's tough. <laughs> it really is, because each one holds a special place in my heart for different reasons. Sure. But I will say this. Gary Oldman's performance in Coppola's Dracula, yeah. it's truly something special. He manages to be both monstrous and sympathetic. Terrifying, but strangely alluring at the same time. It's a tough balance. It really is. Yeah. It's a master class in playing a character with that kind of complexity. High praise. Yeah. I'll have to revisit that one. <laughs> yeah. So as we drive a stake through this conversation, at least for now, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from this deep dive? I love that. Think about it, folks. It's like you're watching the movie with a whole new perspective. Right. You start to see the filmmaker's choices and you realize how much thought goes into bringing these stories to life. And those choices, they can tell you a lot about the time period, the culture, even the director's own personal take on the story. Exactly. It's like being a cultural detective looking for clues in every frame. So cool. But at the end of the day, the best adaptations, the ones we really connect with, they're more than just history lessons, right? Oh, absolutely. The best ones, they stay with you long after the credits roll. They make you think, they make you feel and they spark conversation. For sure. I mean, we've been talking about Dracula for a while now, and I feel like we've only scratched the surface. Right. There's always something more to uncover. It's like he's this this endless source of fascination. He really is. Hey. And I think that's the enduring power of Dracula. He's this blank canvas that we can project our own fears onto, our own desires, fascinations. So well said. It's never just a vampire movie, is it? There's always something deeper going on. Always. Well, folks. There you have it. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive into Dracula adaptations. From the silent era to the 90s, we've seen how filmmakers have tackled this iconic story. We've seen how they've wrestled with those big questions about good and evil, about desire and temptation, about what it means to be human in a world where monsters lurk in the shadows. And we've seen how Dracula himself has evolved from monstrous villain to, well, to something a little more complex. And let's not forget about those faithful adaptations that stuck close to the source material. They have their own charm, don't they? Absolutely. They remind us that sometimes the simplest approach is the most effective. It's all about finding what works for you as a viewer, right? What speaks to you on a personal level. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so the next time you're in the mood for a good scare, why not revisit one of these Dracula films we talked about? Or even better, pick up a copy of Bram Stoker's novel. You might be surprised by how creepy, how thought-provoking it still is after all these years. And who knows? You might even discover your new favorite Dracula adaptation. Until next time, happy watching.